Welcome back to TECM 5200. I'm going to talk about what happens after a content audit by covering three topics in this video lecture. I'm going to start by distinguishing tactics from strategy. Then I'll define tactical conclusions about content. Finally, I'll explain how to communicate content gaps. All right, so part one is about distinguishing between tactics and strategy. I want you to imagine you want to retire on a beach. You could do some things to get money to make that happen. So you could invest in the stock market. You could buy rental property. You could even marry a billionaire. Those three things are tactics which are defined by Merriam-Webster as devices for accomplishing an end. Now, if you went to a financial advisor, I'm guessing that he or she would say those tactics are okay, but you could be much more confident that you'd actually reach your goal if you had a plan for what to buy, how much to buy, and when to do it. That kind of a careful plan would be a strategy for making your dream come true. Take a minute to read this famous quote. Sun Tzu was making the point that your retirement plan won't succeed without specifics on what proportion of investments should be in stocks versus real estate. He was also making the point that you're likely to lose by simply buying stocks without any plan at all. I want to talk about what you do after you create a spreadsheet with all that inventory and audit data about each content asset. The focus now needs to be what to do with all of it. All right, let me help you understand what counts as a tactical conclusion. I've shown you this process diagram in earlier lectures. When the inventory and audit is complete, you've finished what Bailey calls the discovery phase of content strategy development. At this point, you need to summarize and make conclusions about those assets to define the gap between where a business wants to be and where it is now. Let me begin by mentioning that your massive final content asset spreadsheet Capturing your inventory and audit data should contain a column in which the team notes what should happen to each asset in the future. And ultimately, there are only three choices. It should be maintained as it is, it should be modified, or it should be archived. The future of each content asset should be clear to stakeholders as you define the gap between what is and what's desired. Let's listen to Lucy Hyde, Director of Content at PayPal, talk about the need to archive or prune content. We did one at eBay when I was in the same role as I mentioned earlier, the European role at eBay. Um, my boss at the time had sort of said, be audacious, look to remove 30% of pages because we knew that, you know, the content had just not been managed over the years. We were very easily able to remove 50%. So that's the first thing I would say is really, um, if you're particularly if you're looking at content that you know has not been managed closely, don't be afraid of setting audacious goals because it gives you something to aim for. And you can always change them if it very quickly becomes, you know, that 30% for me kind of was like, oh, that's high. And then I very quickly realized it was probably double that deleting or archiving old content assets should always be something the content strategy development team considers. While there's no algorithm for summarizing your data, it should be straightforward for many items on your spreadsheet. I don't want to underestimate the challenge this presents, but here's a simple example. Let's say your team found that few dates were available for last update. Figure out what percentage and Report that as a gap between what the current state versus the goal state is. Your summary finding, only 5% of assets included the last update. Your conclusion, your tactical conclusion is, need to add the dates. That's a tactic for improving the quality of content. Here's another example. 
Let's say you found the average score for consistency in following the style guide was 3.2 out of 5. It'll be even more insightful if you recognize that the consistency scores were lowest on average for the content on the people page. If you conclude the people page should be updated, then you've created a tactic for improving the quality of content and closing the gap between what is and what the content owners want, which is accurate, high quality content. Before I move ahead, let me note clearly that positive findings, in other words, there is no gap, are also important for you to report. Let's say your team found that nearly all the CTAs or calls to action met or exceeded whatever the set standards were. You would want to report that as a success with no need for follow-up. When comparing your content with that of competitors or heroes, you might assess it with many of the same qualitative and quantitative ratings that you're using to assess your own content, whether that's the presence of CTAs or the level of consistency. Most of the time, your team will want to compare the information architecture of your content with that of your competitors or heroes. So how do they categorize and organize similar content? How does their taxonomy or terminology compare to your organization's? How does their search function work compared to yours? You might also want to compare content types. For instance, does your competitor include user feedback buttons on every page of their technical documentation while your organization does not? Or perhaps your heroes have implemented DITA, but your organization has not. Or you might want to compare channels for delivering content. Does your hero site include animated GIFs demonstrating common user actions, while your organization includes only static text and screenshots? The goal of your analysis is to determine the gap between your organization's content and your competitors or heroes. There are details about competitor or industry analysis in several content strategy books, including Nichols in the chapter on the Assess Phase. Nichols says, I quote, looking at what competitors do, how they do it, and what they say can help you identify opportunities, end quote. Nichols also provides a list of free resources for doing a little industry research on content performance. All right, so in part three, I want to explain how to communicate the conclusions and gaps you've discovered during your content assessment. I'm going to do that by presenting you with three general principles. Principle one is categorize your audit findings into themes. In his book, Enterprise Content Strategy, Nichols shows clearly in chapter five on the define phase how you have to consolidate all your lists of tactical conclusions and your insights to form an overall strategy framework. He lists eight categories you might need to report on at the end of your audit. These are important. I encourage you to look at that list. I'm going to go through that very quickly. One, business goals and objectives. Two, content quality. Three, content structure or information architecture. Four, accessibility compliance or other types of compliance in regulated industries. Five, content lifecycle. Six, content analytics. Seven, SEO, taxonomy and metadata. And eight, content governance. Nichols also says, I quote, an audit report should call attention key themes as opposed to listing each issue and then provide a few examples, end of quote. Let me give you an example. Your team should report all content quality conclusions in a single section of the report, even if your discovery process identified several types of content quality issues using several sources. In other words, Content might have been missing, inaccurate, or inconsistent. You might have learned about inconsistency through both a qualitative review and customer comments. However, to make it easier for content stakeholders to grasp the gap that your findings expose, you want to categorize all of them under content quality. You don't need to be exhaustive in your write-up. Remember, content owners can get the full details for every content asset from the spreadsheet you're providing them with. Principle two is tie findings to existing business goals. The importance of this principle cannot be overstated. It's why Nichols begins his list of categories for reporting audit findings with business goals. 
You want to highlight any data you discovered that directly measures the impact of content on something that increases revenue or decreases expenses. Even if you don't have those type of findings, you can tie findings to a gap in business goals. For example, imagine that an organization has identified three other companies in the same industry as peers or heroes. Your team should report the gap you identified between the structure of content on the organization's website and the structure on two of the three sites of industry leaders that are different. Even though you can't report dollars lost, you can report the gap between what is in the organization and what the organization has said they want to be, like their heroes. Finally, principle three is phrase your findings and gaps in content respectfully. Again, in chapter five, Nichols cautions the content strategy development team to tread lightly. Let me quote him again. I've seen audits presented in a form that illuminates only the pain points. Such an approach can offend stakeholders or those involved with the work, making them feel as if they have to defend their work. I've also seen audits that use terms like horrible, ugly, and completely unusable. End of quote. It's critical to keep in mind that issues or gaps that you found were not always created out of choice. Even if this were so, the content strategist who describes someone else's work without respect is going to have little influence. As Nichols also wrote, use value neutral terms and stick to the ways that the issue prevents an organization from meeting its objectives or uh, it affects customer tasks. In other words, I want you to build support for taking on the gaps you've uncovered by starting from an area of agreement or shared values. I talked with Christina Halverson in November of 2020. Sadly, I can't share our video recording, but I do want to share a short story Christina told me about a time when she did a more qualitative content audit of a website. The website owners were on board, even if they were a little skeptical about what could be done. Christina reported that her team uncovered a list of eight themes in their audit. Everything from an inappropriate reading level for copy to an unbrowsable information architecture and broken internal search function. Her team wasn't certain how their findings would be received. I'll quote her description here for you to read. The ability to assess content and present those findings can have a huge impact on an organization. That's what makes content strategy rewarding. I told you in the module one lecture of defining content strategy as simply a plan for managing content in a way that maximizes business value. Ultimately, the goal of every content strategist is to be strategic. But you can't go directly from a spreadsheet full of inventory and audit data to a strategy. In this lecture, I focused primarily on making tactical conclusions. In the next lecture, I'll talk about the true strategic level of content recommendations and roadmaps.